Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jamil, and uh, I'll be introducing today's event. Uh, the title and subject of today's uh, uh, webinar, hosted by author and activist Miko Pellet, is The Targeted Campaign to Topple Jeremy Corbyn. So a little bit of background. Uh, in September 2018, the UK Labour Party adopted a, a controversial guideline on anti-Semitism issued by the IHRA, which is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. This definition folds criticism of Israel's treatment of Palestinians into the actual definition. So this establish, establishes potentially a powerful apparatus of censorship, which would punish and silence Palestinian rights advocates within the party. So pro-Israel groups, along with UK's uh, neoliberal establishment, uh, you really worked tirelessly to, to tarnish the character of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, of Chris Williamson, uh, Tony Greenstein and, and several other members of labor. And, and this sophisticated disinformation and smear campaign, uh, you know, culminated in Corbyn's recent uh, and shocking ousting from UK labor just what, uh, you know, a week and a half ago or so. So today we are really fortunate to have an excellent panel with us um, to not only analyze this historical event in UK politics, but also to really understand the forces responsible for it, in addition to what might lie ahead for UK labor under this very new dangerous standard. It should be said that we, we also have a panel with us today who have some, uh, let's call it lived experience being in, in the crosshairs of these relentless smear campaigns. So on today's panel, we are fortunate enough to have Chris Williamson, a second time guest with us, former Labor MP for Derby North, city, count, city council leader and activist. We also have Asa Wynn Stanley, uh, journalist, associate editor at the Electronic Intifada, also second time Miko Pellet alum. And uh, new to the Miko Pellet webinar world, we have Tony Greenstein, activist, founding member of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign and Jews for Boycotting Israeli Goods, and author of A History of Fighting Fascism in Brighton. So welcome to each of you, and, and thank you so much for your time and for your insights today. And I believe we are ready to start here. So I'm going to hand it over to Miko. Thank you, Jamil. <clears throat> and uh, thank you, everybody. That's uh, all the participants. I see the numbers are growing very rapidly. Uh, Chris, Asa, and Tony, thank you so much uh, for your valuable time and for your willingness to uh, participate in this. Uh, like Jamil said, you've all been You've all experienced this, uh, the, the, the accusations of anti-Semitism and, 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 and what has been going on within the Labor Party. And so I think your input here is, is invaluable. Um, I don't think there's any doubt that um, the ousting or you know, what seems like the ousting of Jeremy Corbyn from uh, Labor Party, UK Labor Party, uh, was, was planned in advance and meticulously planned. Um, and we could see over the last three, four years how the, 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 the ring around him, the people who supported him, the people who were fighting with him against racism and for, and for um, social justice and progressive values uh, were taken down bit by bit up to the point where he was really left alone and, uh, and, and now he himself has been, has been taken down. And um, it seems that uh, he made, uh, even though he, there's, there's no question that he's not a racist, there's no question that neither he or any of you, of course, are anti-Semitic in any way, shape or form, there was a big strategic mistake in the way he handled this and the way the Labour Party perhaps handled this, uh, the accusations of anti-Semitism. And it could go back, I think, um, to the uh, big mistake of accepting this new definition, the IHRA, what's called the IHRA Working Definition of Anti-Semitism, which basically shields Israel from criticism and binds all the organizations that have accepted it, whether they're governmental or non-governmental organizations, that have um, accepted and adopted this definition. It binds them in a way that now they cannot say anything about Israel, cannot criticize Israel without being accused. Uh, as being anti-Semitic. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, well thought out uh, shield, very well thought out strategy. Um, I'd like to start by going around um, and, and just maybe briefly, you guys can each tell the story of your own experience within the Labour Party in this relation. And uh, perhaps Tony, we'll start with you. Uh, what, 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 was your, what was your experience in this regard? Well, I'm fairly unique in that 
20 years ago, uh, 1992, I was suspended from the Labour Party, not for anti-Semitism, I hasten to add, but uh, part of the kind of uh, anti-poll tax campaigners and general left-wing troublemakers by during a Neil Kinnock witch hunt. So I was suspended for just one year and I didn't rejoin. Uh, and then I rejoined, it was uh, shortly after Jeremy was elected, uh, about October 2015. And then out of the blue in March uh, 2016, I received a letter from John Stolliday of the Compliance Unit telling me I had been suspended for comments I was alleged to have made. Now, they gave me no clue as to what those comments were. I only discovered later what they were. It was things like I compared Israel's uh, law return and its marriage laws uh, to Nazi Germany. And that was, of course, held to be anti-Semitic until I pointed out to my investigator that Hannah Arendt, who was a refugee from Nazi Germany, had made just such comments in her book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, uh, The Banality of Evil. So, I mean, that was, for me, was the beginning. Uh, but actually the anti-Semitism campaign had been going on even before Corbyn was elected. So this was a carefully thought out strategy uh, by people uh, whose identity uh, we can speculate about. So, I mean, that was my experience at the very beginning anyway. And, and I think, you know, you were one of about half a million people who joined the Labour Party when Jeremy Corbyn became leader. So I'm not it, sure it was that high, but it was a considerable number. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and so this was this was the, his his leadership, his his uh, his leadership in the Labour Party was it was a great promise, really. And a lot of people decided to join. Absolutely, yes. Yes. And, and, um, yes, it infused uh, hundreds of thousands, millions even. Uh, yeah. with the potential promise of change yeah. uh, and the tragedy is that Corbyn never ever understood the nature of the attack on him from the yeah. very start he sought to appease his enemies yeah and you know uh, when it comes to Zionists you can't appease them uh, because they know no reason yes and sadly we were learning this lesson too late it would be nice if we all mm -hmm. sat here as this was happening earlier on and perhaps perhaps some of you actually uh, did uh, and, and warned that this is this is what's happening asa let you, your story is is a little bit different yeah i didn't join the labor party initially because in 2015 i didn't join despite you know i could see that corbin was something different from the awfulness of the Labour Party, basically. I mean, to me, uh, I, I started becoming an activist and a campaigner in uh, 2001, really, after 9-11. And so to me, the Labour Party was the war party, basically. Um, so, and, and then there was always sort of one or two MPs who uh, were good. <laughs> essentially and Corbyn was one of them who would, who would go to the demonstrations and so forth um anti-war demonstrations um and uh it was um it, it, so when he became the leader um it, it was a massive change um, but I still didn't join and it was because I knew something like this would happen I don't think I s foresaw like the the extent to which it became a real kind of national uh, crisis, manufactured crisis. Um, but, you know, I knew I, I would probably be purged at some point if I joined the Labour Party, so I didn't. Um, but I didn't join until um, 2016 when there was the coup, uh, when the Labour, when I, th I believe it was three quarters of Labour MPs voted to um, no confidence in Jeremy Corbyn. Um, so uh, I, uh, you know, I was basically persuaded by others to join, um, to kind of to just resist the coup, basically. Um, so I, I joined from. 2015, uh, 2016, um, and I wasn't really vocal about it. It was just my own sort of private, you know, resistance, I suppose. 
Um, I, you know, gave, I, I did a little bit of campaigning in the 2017 election, but um, not very much, you know, I'm more of a you know, writer than an activist these days. And um, I was eventually pushed out. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was suspended and um when were you suspended uh in i think february 2019 and then i was uh the art I, i'll put an article i'll put articles in in the chat but essentially i was like a lot of others i was suspended for saying factually accurate things <laughs> about pro israel groups in in the labor party um and then um eventually i saw no choice i saw that it was sort of the process was being rigged and as, they, as it was your, against Chris, and it was they, against tony didn't they reject your um request to uh cover the labor party conference last year yeah that's right yeah so while i was still suspended um they you know i applied in the normal way to cover uh, for a press pass for a Labour Party conference, and um, it was first approved, and then it, it, I didn't actually get the pass, but I got the approval in the email, so that it, it was saying that the pass was about to come. Um, and then, at somebody at some point made a political decision to um, roll that approval back. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for that. And then, uh, and Chris, you, you've, you, I mean, you, when the first time I met you in 2017, like I said earlier, I don't know if this was on your mind, but the people that introduced me to you and the people in the audience as you were speaking were whispering to me that the, the hope is and the, the, the expectation is that uh, you will become deputy, deputy leader. Clearly, uh, your position in the party was an important one, particularly in the context of a Jeremy Corbyn type of Labour Party. Um, and then you were targeted and you fought it and you targeted and you really fought it and you proved that the accusations against you were, were, were false. Um, and yet here we are. So can you talk a little bit about your story, but also what in the world happened here? How did this, how were they able to really bring down you know, someone like yourself who was, who was really a pillar within the, you were not just an activist from the outside who joined, you were part of the party um, in this campaign to bring down Jeremy Corbyn and to bring down this, the progressive part of the party. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mika. Thanks for inviting us on again. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've been a member of the Labour Party, had been for 44 years. I've devoted my life to the party as a dedicated activist was active in every election from the mid-1970s uh, and active in between elections as well. And one of the things I was always trying to do is encourage people to join the Labour Party, to make it a more progressive, a more socialist organised uh, 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 institution, as it were. And, and I felt that, you know, if we could get more people on side like me who shared my worldview, shared the worldview of people like Jeremy Corbyn, that we would be in a much better place to be able to shape the agenda going forward. I never saw myself when I first joined the party as being a, an elected official, a, a councillor, or indeed a, a member of, of parliament. But, you know, life has a funny way of sort of twisting and turning. And ultimately, I did find myself uh, with the privilege of, of, elect, of being elected to represent my, my home town. But I, I mean, you mentioned uh, uh, about, you know, if we'd have had the, been having this conversation, you know, perhaps a while ago, maybe we could have avoided it. People like myself were warning about what was happening. I'd said repeatedly that, look, the, the chase, they're after me, but I'm merely collateral damage. You know, they've already taken out people like Ken Livingston and Jackie Walker, etc. Ultimately, they're after Jeremy Corbyn because they want to smash this socialist project, this project which actually is committed to an ethical foreign policy, a foreign policy which would have put peace and disarmament as a top priority. And obviously solidarity with the Palestinian people and holding the Israeli regime's feet to the fire. So I was targeted, you're absolutely right, from the uh, outset really of being uh, elected uh, to uh, re-elected to parliament. I was a member of parliament from 2010 to 2015 and lost my seat, got re-elected in 2017. But when Jeremy put his name on the ballot paper, I immediately got behind him. 
And really from that point in time, I was uh, targeted, obviously it's a lower level, but was nevertheless targeted all the same. And when I came back, was re-elected in 2017, I gave an interview to The Guardian, quite an extended interview. And uh, one of the points I was making is that the, the accusations against Jeremy Corbyn were, um, were uh, uh, essentially bullshit, I think was the term I uh, used, uh, and uh, were just smears. And I specifically cited a number of different accusations which was being targeted at, uh, which would be, he was being targeted with, things like um, he was an IRA sympathizer or he supported despotic regimes around the world, that he was sexist, all these absurd uh, remarks. And uh, of course, this thing that was getting a little bit of traction that he was an anti-Semite. So I was kind of targeted, but what I therefore felt I needed to do was to really get behind a democratization agenda in the party. And that, and that made me, uh, as it were, doubly targeted because the members of parliament didn't want to be subject to any democratic accountability of the membership. And the point I was making both to the socialist campaign group and to Jeremy and his, and his uh, team of advisors is that we, we have to win this civil war inside the Labour Party, because if we get elected with the current parliamentary Labour Party, which are out of control, I mean, you go to the used to go to the Parliamentary Labour Party meetings, they would heckle Jeremy Corbyn, they would absolutely howl me down, it wasn't just heckles, they would absolutely howl me down if, if ever I spoke, even when I was talking about urging people to come together and find common cause, that there's more than unites and divides us. I was absolutely incredibly shouted down for, for having the temerity to say such a thing. And this was just two days before I was uh, actually uh, suspended. And um, they made it their business to uh, uh, target me with these absurd uh, invented uh, smears. And where we went wrong was, well, one in not actually the leadership not confronting this, but where we, where we particularly went wrong, I think, as, a, as a, the leadership, if you like, of the movement, the socialist campaign group, you would like to think are, of MPs, that is, you would like to think are, or they sort of portray themselves as leadership of the movement, would have actually shown some solidarity with uh, comrades who were being thrown under the bus with these invented accusations. I mean, Tony Greenstein was, was, I think, one of the first victims of the witch hunt, the son of a rabbi whose father fought the Oswald Mosley's fascists at the Battle of Cable Street in 1936. Ken Livingston, who's probably done more than anybody, in my opinion, to fight the cause of, of anti-racism. He got he earned the sobriquet as a loony lefty in the 1980s for his role in the, as leader of the GLC, the Greater London Council in actually putting this issue, you know, centre stage. He worked, believe it or not, with the Board of Deputies in terms of what could the GLC do, what could he do as the uh, Mayor of London when he subsequently came back in that role to deal with uh, uh, bigotry and, and you know, anti-Semitism. Uh, so his record is unimpeachable. They didn't support him. They didn't support Ken, they didn't support Tony, they didn't support Jackie, a black Jewish woman who was the vice chair of Momentum. They said nothing. I was literally the only one, Miko, the only MP I'm not saying this to blow my own trumpet or anything, but I was the only MP prepared to speak out and stand up for people who were being falsely accused. I mean, to me, it just was, in my opinion, as a socialist, solidarity should be, you know, a cornerstone of your belief system. And if you fail to show solidarity to people who are being th thrown under the bus on an industrial scale, I mean, what, what are you doing? Why are you as why are you claiming to be a socialist MP if you're not prepared to speak out? I mean, you know, it just to me uh, was an obvious and 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 common sense thing and and uh, and an obligation really on me to to speak out, even though people were urging me not to. People were saying, you know, keep your distance from from Jackie Walker. I was even advised ahead of the 2017 election to distance myself from Jeremy Corbyn because I was told by people who were sympathetic who had a catastrophic idea about you know, political strategy, they, they advised me to keep your distance from Jeremy Corbyn because the most important thing is that we get you elected, that we can regroup. Jeremy needs supporters in the house, but you know, he's politically toxic. And I said, I'm not prepared to do that for two reasons. One, it's a dishonorable thing to do. And secondly, I disagree with you that the, uh, that the agenda is toxic in any way, shape or form. I think this is an electorally attractive proposition and so I issued a press release, uh, my team issued a press release saying that I am the most Corbyn friendly candidate standing anywhere in the country in the most marginal seat in England. And obviously that whetted the appetite of the uh, corporate media. And we had 
you know, we got descended on by a, a, a number of uh, the media hacks who were writing articles in a very sarcastic tone, suggesting that, oh, this guy who, you know, turbocharged Corbyn are, is going to fall flat on his face because, you know, the whole Corbyn project is electorally disastrous. And we secured the biggest increase in vote share since 1945. I won my seat uh, comfortably in that uh, election. And the only reason, in my opinion, we didn't actually secure an outright majority was that we were being sabotaged from the inside. I mean, this has been now a matter of public record with the leaked report, but I was fighting the most marginal seat in England, as I say, Miko, and we got no support whatsoever from our headquarters, from, from head office. So that was part of the problem. And I think it was um, a failure, a, a catastrophic failure to, uh, you know, recognize what our you know, political enemies were, were doing and a, um, uh, a lack of um, any real kind of uh, gumption, I, guess, I suppose, to uh, speak up for what you kind of believed in. And um, they felt that their strategy of, of appeasement and, uh, and um, capitulation would be the way to deal with this. Every time, it's almost they never learned from the light of experience. Every time they would say, well, just adopt the IHRA, for example, and that will that will draw a line under it. Or, you know, just let, let, look, let's just let's just, you know, throw Ken to the wolves and, and that will draw a line under it. You know, Jeremy, just go and apologize to the board of deputies and the Jewish leadership council. You go and prostrate yourself before this this bunch of Zionists and that will draw a line under it. You know, let Chris Williamson get uh, suspended. You know, don't speak out on it because that would draw a line under it. I'm just reminded, I've got to say, of Pastor Niemöller's poem, First They Came, Nico, you know? First they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a Jew. And then they came for me and there's nobody left. Well, isn't that what's happening now? You know? Yeah. Jeremy, in my opinion, I love the guy, but I just think he listened to the wrong advice. If he'd have stood his ground, if he'd spoken up for his reputation, spoken up for the party's reputation, spoken up for comrades like Ken Livingston, Jackie Walker, Tony Greenstein, Mark Wadsworth and others, we wouldn't be in this situation. And his, his advisors have a hell of a lot to answer for because we had a moment in history where we could have, we could have elected a, a socialist government that was committed to a ethical, a genuine ethical foreign policy, a foreign policy that would have seen the UK spreading peace and disarmament around the world. We even had a minister for peace and dis a shadow minister for peace and disarmament. Imagine that the UK, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, uh, promoting peace and disarmament rather than you know arms sales and, and wars, which is what we we do at the moment. Which is and they squandered that opportunity. Squandered yeah. it. I mean, it's a betrayal and it's a disgrace. And the, these people should hang their heads in shame for the for the the, the object in which they they sort of advised Jeremy to deal with this clearly politically motivated smear campaign. Yeah. Well, that's exactly the risk. I mean, that was exactly the, what, what they saw and what they were afraid of. A, a progressive prime minister with a progressive backing, uh, with an agenda that talks about peace and, you know, p -p peace and social justice and so on. That's precisely what they're afraid of because Zionism is on the, on the opposite side of all of these issues. I mean, it's, it's racist, it's violent, it promotes violence, it promotes war. And of course, the, sale, the, the state of Israel peddles weapons to all the darkest regimes. So, I mean, that's precisely what they saw as a threat. And that's precisely why they came after you, even though, and then when I say you, I mean you and Ken Livingston and Tony and the others, um, because that's precisely what they were, uh, what they were afraid of. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the IHRA, um, and uh, Asa, you've got that poster behind you. It says, oppose the IHRA. Can you talk a little bit about the IHRA, what it is, and how it came to be accepted or adopted by the Labour Party? Do you, do you... Yeah, I could talk a, a little bit about it, but just uh, first of all, to just second what Chris said about him being the only MP. Yeah, I think I think this is a really vital point because he was uh, Chris was it, it's true Chris was the I mean I followed this this story um, you know for five and a half years now and it's still going on um, and there were many people who saw from the beginning how you know just tragically wrong this whole um 
campaign was and how uh, how ridiculous it was to say that Jeremy Corbyn was anti-Semitic, you know, and how dangerous it was to just let it be said um, without any kind of pushback. Um, but no MPs, not even Jeremy Corbyn, said anything along those lines that it was a smear, except for Chris. And that's why they they gunned for him straight away. You know, um, the 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 Israel lobby groups they went straight for him. He was he was their you know public enemy number one in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, so yeah, another key important another key thing was the IHRA document was the acceptance of the IHRA document. Um, so, I mean... There was uh, some argument in the party, wasn't there? There was some debate, I think, whether or not to accept it in whole or make some changes, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so it's... Um, it's essentially an, an intensely politicised um, so-called working definition of anti-Semitism, which... Um, contains a confusing uh, definition of anti-Semitism along with uh, 11 examples of what it states are anti-Semitism. And the majority of those examples actually uh, address the state of Israel. And uh, a few of them are, actually, uh, are incredibly dangerous because they potentially outlaw criticism of Israel, uh, pot potentially certainly chill free speech on criticism of Israel and of Zionism, the, the state of Israel's um, ruling ideology. Um, so there was, um, there was kind there was debate in the sense of it was discussed whether to adopt the whole thing. So Jeremy Corbyn, the people around him, he tried to do this overly clever thing of, or what, it, what it, they thought was overly clever, they thought was clever. Um, of just adopting the definition and not the examples and they thought like nobody would notice that but of course then the Zionists then used that more as a, a wedge issue um, and then you know it resulted in this whole um, the really the peak of the witch hunt in um, in the summer of 2018 where it was there was the Labour leaders the left-wing Labour leaders were saying ah oh, well we have adopted the definition and, and then the Zionists would come back and say, oh, well, we haven't adopted, you know, you, but you haven't adopted the example. So therefore you haven't adopted the whole thing. Um, it was, it, this is part of a much longer campaign by Israel lobby groups and the state of Israel itself to change the definition of anti-Semitism, which goes back decades, really. You know, um, the Israeli for, then Israeli Foreign Minister Abba Eban in 1972, I believe it was, for, um, pushed this phrase, the new anti-Semitism. And essentially what, what the new anti-Semitism is, is um, it's kind of like, it, it, it's uh, kind of like a rebranding exercise to change um, the definition of anti-Semitism away from uh, discrimination against Jews to criticism of Israel and his ideology Zionism of having a uh, having a Jewish state in a country Palestine which is overwhelmingly historically not Jewish so um, you know it was it it, it it was a part of a long-running battle because I mean the RHRA definition originated only in 20. Uh, in, only in 2016, but it was almost identical to an earlier definition. So um, the which was um, basically dropped by a an EU body. What so, it, uh, Asa, have you ever been, been able to find out? Because I couldn't. Who in the world is the IHRA, and what, who's behind them, and who makes them an authority? to suddenly redefine what anti-Semitism is? I mean, and why are people listening to them? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it's... Because I, I was not able to find any answers in, with my, you know, with my limited, uh, you know, resources to, what, you know, what's behind them and why are people listening to them? 
Cool. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a good question. Like, it, it, it's been treated as almost holy writ, you know, and well, it, it's just it. essentially it's because I'll just because it, 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 it's yeah. something that's being pushed by the Israel lobby and, and the state of Israel. It's become a useful document. It's part of this, of the Zionist movement's quite long history of taking sometimes obscure documents and bodies and then just utilizing them to their advantage essentially to try and continue the colonization of of palestine yeah. and to push for um support for their project um from western governments yeah it's really quite incredible um tony your, your history with this goes back uh quite a ways as you were saying earlier um what's your take on the ihra and and how it was handled and 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 what it says well, the Irish, okay. you don't need to be a genius to understand what anti-Semitism is. I mean, the analogy I always give is when my dad went into battle in the Battle of Cable Street in 1936 against Oswald Mosley's fascists. A uh, hundred thousand Jews and non-Jewish dockers and workers did. Uh, he, uh, and he knew what anti-Semitism was. It was someone who attacks you because you're a Jew. It's hatred or hostility of Jews as Jews. I mean, it, it's simple. You don't need a 500 word definition, which isn't even a definition. I mean, the problem the Zionists faced was they made all these accusations of anti-Semitism, but people were still thinking about anti-Semitism in terms of hatred or hostility to Jews. The purpose of the IHRA was to redefine anti-Semitism as anti-Zionism, in essence. I mean, yeah. that's what it comes down to. And who are the IHRA? Well, they're just an intergovernmental body which was set up, uh, I don't know, 20 odd years ago to commemorate the, the Holocaust. And it was seen as a suitable vehicle with which to take up the old working definition of anti-Semitism, which had been written specifically to equate hostility to Zionism with hostility to Jews. It was called, I mean, Israel was the new Jew amongst the nations, yeah? So they redefined anti-Semitism, not as hatred of Jews, but as hatred of Israel or Zionism. Except of course, well, you can't, racism is a, about people. It's not about states. It's not about objects, inanimate uh, uh, constructs, if you like. So, I mean, that was what it was about, but. The problem with Jeremy Corbyn is he never understood what it was he was being faced with. He never understood the attack on him. He, he had a strategy, which I'm sure he worked out with Seamus Millen and others, of appeasing the right, because the right was an overwhelming majority in the PLP, of trying to win them over to his project. But, you know... The PLP, excuse me, PLP is the... Uh, is the Parliamentary the Labour Party, sorry, yes. The problem was that their hard bitten right wingers, Blairites in the main, who, who were not going to subscribe uh, to the Corbyn project in any shape or form. Couple that with, I mean, the first newspaper to take up the anti Semitism cause was the Daily Mail. It was the beginning of August <laughs> when they alleged he was associating with a Holocaust denier called Paul Lyson. Now, I mean, <laughs> the Daily Mail is notorious for its hatred and hostility to refugees. It's a racist newspaper. Before the war, it supported Hitler. It used to campaign against the admission of bogus Jewish refugees in Nazi Germany. They were only coming here because they wanted a better lifestyle. You know, that, that was what the, the Daily Mail was about. So why should the Mail and the Express and the rest of the tabloid, including the Guardian, be suddenly so concerned with anti-Semitism? I mean, the Daily Mail and Sun employed Katie Hopkins he described refugees coming from North Africa as cockroaches, you know, which is a Nazi style term, vermin. It's what Hitler said about the Jews back of us. So why should they be concerned about anti-Semitism? Clearly they're not. Anti-Semitism was the convenient flag under which they could attack Corbyn. And that makes sense. You know, if they attack Corbyn because he didn't want austerity or cuts to children's uh, school meals or anything else they wouldn't get much support if you pose it in terms of a moral question like anti-semitism it suddenly makes you feel righteous that's what anti-semitism did it's a badge of identity not simply for israel but actually the west the west has incorporated zionism into itself and appropriated the memory of the holocaust 
And in doing that, it thinks it can have right on its side. So you have the absurd situation in Vienna when Ronnie Casarils, a, a Jewish ex-commander uh, of the ANC's military wing, you know, a man who's anti-racist credentials, no one can question. He's barred from the local authority premises to speak. A unanimous vote of Vienna Council. And who voted? Not only the Social Democrats and the Greens, but the neo-Nazi Freedom Party. And the same in the Bundestag, the most hostile party uh, to a BDS. What, what wasn't even the Christian Democrats or the Social Democrats. It was a neo-Nazi alternative for Germany. Uh, so we have this situation today. The, the most ardent supporters of Israel are also the people who don't really like Jews very much. It's always been the case, but today I think it should be pretty obvious. Yeah, and, and when you look, looking back, I think, I mean, that's great insight, Tony. You know, looking at, looking at the IHRA uh, and some of the, the examples that they give, mm. um, accusing Jewish citizens of being more loyal to Israel, um, well, I think when you look at the Board of Deputies, for example, or some of the some of the Zionists in the UK, who they clearly are agents of Zionism. In other in other words, but now you can't say this because if you say this, you can't attack them, you can't criticize them because if you say this, it's anti-Semitism, denying Jewish people the right to self-determination by on that one, the, the dual loyalty one, because that's usually brought out against us, isn't it? Precisely. You know, it's anti-Semitic to say Jews are disloyal, but the whole point of Zionism is to make Jews alienated from their society, to make them loyal to Israel. Yes, in, in, I think it was yeah. 2014, the Israeli embassy and the ministry, Israeli Ministry of Absorption actually had an opinion poll survey of American Jews as to what would you do in a crisis in relations between the United States and Israel? Who would you support? Who would you be loyal to? Zionism is inherently about dual loyalty. I mean, the number of times I've been accused of being a traitor, and I ask, what am I a traitor to? Israel? I, uh, I don't live there. I'm not a citizen of there. But that is a Zionist accusation. Precisely. Precisely. And that's and, and, I, and, and having accepted this definition, um, it's impossible to say, to, to say exactly what you say, which is absolutely true, because the whole premise is that Jews should leave where they are and go somewhere else. That's right go and serve in the military and so forth and then you've got denying jewish people the right to self-determination by claiming the existence of israel is a racist state first of all israel is not an expression of jewish self-determination it's an expression of israeli and zionist self-determination but um um and on and on you know the, the 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 and but even when we look at these examples and chris i'll go back to you i don't believe you or jeremy uh, have ever even said these things. In other words, Jeremy Corbyn's premise was always a two-state solution. It was quite a Zionist premise. He never came out against uh, in, in any way that I could, that, that I ever heard uh, it, it, to express even this level. And yet they, they, they were, they, they came after him. Am I, am I, am I right? Yeah. You're absolutely right. And of course it has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. I mean, the truth is Jeremy absolutely never did say anything which could be remotely regarded as anti-Semitic, nor did I for that matter. I mean, I was never in fact accused of anti-Semitism by the Labour Party officially. I mean, very, many kind of Zionists and, and, and uh, you know, right wing uh, sort of uh, neoliberals who jumped on the uh, anti-Semitism uh, bandwagon uh, would, uh, would often do so. But the truth is the official charge seat that was levelled against me was a kind of an Orwellian phrase that was used where I was guilty of what they described as a pattern of behavior. And uh, I was uh, uh, alleged to have been a Jew beta, believe it or not. And uh, the reason why I was a Jew beta, for example, was because I'd responded to a request from Jewish members of the Labour Party to show a film about the attacks on uh, Zionist, anti-Zionist Jews in the House of Commons, in a room in the House of Commons, a film that, I think all but one of the participants in which were themselves Jewish. That was one of the charges that was leveled uh, against me. Uh, and, and so it went on. I mean, another one was because I'd referred someone uh, to a video by Norman Finkelstein, who was taking Margaret Hodge to task for trying to draw an equivalence between the horrors of the Holocaust and her receiving a letter from the Labour Party 
uh, chiding her for saying that Jeremy Corbyn, excuse my uh, language now, is a racist fucking anti-Semite. And uh, in the House of Commons chamber, believe it or not, behind the Speaker's chair, in front of a load of Tories. Understandably, she got a letter reminding her of her uh, obligations as a, as, a, as a member of Parliament and certain decorums should be applied. She should have got far worse than that. She should have been expelled from the party for such a transgression, in my view. And uh, of course, that never, never uh, happened. But no, you're absolutely right. No, I was never accused of uh, directly of, of anti-Semitism. There's a range of uh, you know, bogus uh, charges. And in fact, I had a meeting with the General Secretary of the Labour Party um, two weeks before I was actually actually suspended me. And this was somebody who was brought in. It was allegedly on the side, allegedly a supporter of Jeremy Corbyn, allegedly a socialist. And yet she accelerated the witch hunt. I mean, I think more people were suspended and expelled under Jenny Formby's watch than under Ian Nichols. But she um, was uh, uh, asking me why I was attending so many meetings around the country because I'd been invited. I was promoting democracy, promoting the, the Corbyn uh, project. And, um, you know, she, she told me that she would be, in her words, pissed off if I went into her constituency, uh, if she was an MP. And, you know, she very clearly was, uh, you know, not happy with the sort of activities that I was engaged in. And she said to me, I get more complaints about you, Chris, than every other member of the Labour Party put together. And I said, that sounds fairly implausible, but if it's true, Jenny, surely that indicates to you, does it not? But that's a concerted, a confected campaign. And you need to just simply, you know, treat it with the contempt it deserves, throw it in the waste bin. To which she was very, you know, um, animated and, uh, and annoyed at my response. She said, well, what do you think we've done? We haven't taken any complaints against you, have we? I said, well, why would you? You've just acknowledged, because she accepted that they were uh, confected. Um, uh, it was a confected, you know, pile of nonsense. She kind of accepted that point. So I said, well, why would you, Jenny? You've just accepted that they, they don't really amount to any real genuine um, uh, complaints about me. It's a confected campaign and this is faux outrage which is being uh, shown here. And, you know, you need to we need to stand up to this because it's, you know, it's, it's just going to end badly if we don't. Anyway, the meeting ended and uh, as I say, a fortnight later, I, um, uh, I uh, was uh, suspended by her. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, I made the mistake, I've got to say as well, Miko, of issuing a qualified statement on the day. That was as a favour to Jeremy's team in the leader's office. It was the day of the Prime Minister's questions and they were saying, oh, this is going to come up in, in, in the House because there was lots of headlines about me speaking at a, a meeting, a big rally in Shefford, where I'd said that Labour had been too apologetic about its, uh, the way it's responded to the issue of anti-Semitism. I mean, our record, I was saying, stands any examination. We've been leading the charge on, on, on tackling um, anti-Semitism and all forms of, of bigotry. And, and, and we've invited these criticisms because of the way in which we've, we've responded. I said, we backed off for too much. That was being misrepresented in the media. And I made the mistake of issuing a qualified apology on that day. That was then weaponized uh, against me. And uh, I was, um, before I'd left that meeting, and I'd said to the people in there that, you know, the reason we're in this situation is because you've, you've handled this whole question of anti-Semitism, these anti-Semitism smears very badly from start to finish, to which they agreed, but said, oh, but we are where we are now. And I issued this statement. That was supposed to be the end of the matter. But before I'd left that meeting room, I was told that I was going to be subject to an official investigation by the party. And before the end of the afternoon, I was, it was elevated to a full suspension. And to add insult to injury, they notified the press before they notified me. As I was receiving the telephone call, I was outside Parliament, the parliamentary estate uh, on, on the uh, Parliament Street in Whitehall. And uh, as I was taking the call to say I was being suspended, a Sky News TV crew came down the street, filming me taking the telephone call to tell me I was suspended. And then as soon as I came off the call, they were asking me what my reaction was to uh, being suspended from the Labour Party and had I spoken to Jeremy Corbyn, etc., etc. I mean, it's absolutely dis despicable, disreputable behaviour from start to finish. The bureaucracy is broken inside the Labour Party, not just under the McNichol regime, but under the Formby regime as well. I regret to say that, but that is the fact of the matter. And sadly, these characters had Jeremy's ear and they were given in catastrophic advice. And this is where it's ended, Jeremy's suspension. And I think ultimately, ultimately expulsion from the Labour Party. A man who's given his life to the Labour Party, a man who's given his life to fighting racism is traduced in this way. But of course, he's not the only one. As I've already said, Ken Livingston, Mark Wadsworth, Jackie Walker, Tony Greenstein, myself, and many, many other 
grassroots activists who've experienced incredible, many of them, uh, bouts of, of, of severe mental ill health. This It's really affected people. At oh, yeah. you know, I know at least one person who's attempted to take her own life as a consequence of it. I know many other people who've lost their employment as a direct consequence of these despicable, outrageous smears. And the Labour Party, when they suspend people now in order to cover themselves, believe it or not, they give them the, the telephone number of the Samaritans, a helpline for people who are experiencing suicidal uh, thoughts. It's just, it's, you know, you, if you'd have said this to me 10 years ago, this is where the Labour Party went out. I'd have said, it's, no, don't be ridiculous. The Labour Party is a party that stands up for people, that, that defends people that looks out for vulnerable people. It would never do that to people. And yet here we are. Yeah. Absolutely despicable and outrageous behavior. These people, I mean, they should, um, you know, hang their heads in shame. They're a bloody disgrace, uh, Miko. They really are. And as you can tell, I feel quite passionate about it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely, and you're outrageous absolutely, behavior. Yeah. Outrageous yeah. behavior. You're absolutely right. You gave you gave you gave your life to the party. You gave your life to the cause, to an important cause of helping people and and being on the right on the right side of these issues and fighting anti-Semitism and fighting racism, which is why so many other people joined the Labour Party because they believe exactly. in, in Jeremy and the things that you stand for. And I remember also when I was um, over the years of several several uh, of the uh, Labour Party uh, conventions, you know, just talking to people and just. You know, normal, like, you know, rank and file members who would tell me stories of how they were suddenly suspended as well yeah. uh, because of a post they shared on Facebook, which was never actually explained to them. In other words, they never really were told what the post was, but the context was somehow, uh, I don't know, some, something vague, similar to what you were describing. And they were suddenly suspended and they've been members also for, very, for a very long time. So it's and almost exclusively, Miko. They were socialists, they were pro-Palestinian activists, yeah. and certainly Jeremy Corbyn supporters. It was Jeremy's Praetorian Guard in the grassroots that was being systematically attacked. And, it, and it's completely unacceptable in my view for people who, as I was saying earlier, who, who, who aspire to be the leaders of, of, of a socialist movement in the socialist campaign group of Labour MPs who did not speak up for a solitary soul and they're just, I mean, now grudgingly, some of them, you know, getting behind Jeremy. But a lot of them haven't even supported Jeremy. They do not deserve to describe themselves as socialists. And they shouldn't, they certainly shouldn't be described by others as socialists. Yeah. It's like you said. It's, it's, part, part, it's possible to be. They're a bloody disgrace. And you know, the, like, uh, I'm sorry, girl, who's this? It's, Asa, it's, like, it's like you said um, towards the beginning, Miko, it was an attempt to uh, divide and rule, basically. It was an yeah. attempt to bring slowly, the supporters of Corbyn were getting less and less and less until we see now um, that there's, uh, you know, even the, the so-called left-wing MPs in the Labour Party, some of them are not supporting him, you know, don't feel able to support him. And it, it was one by one, you know, and it was, it started really from, Ken Livingstone, you know, yeah. there was too many people who called themselves left wing, who um, who had some kind of platform or national profile, who really threw Ken Livingstone under the bus because they they saw him, you know, maybe they had some sort of grudge with him, um, you know, it, uh, and they just sort of thought, well, well, it'll just be this person we'll just sort of let this one go and it will be all right and you know it'll be a kind of sacrifice for the um for the it wasn't just a person it was a pillar. ken livingston was a was a pillar in the labor party i mean i i'm not a brit but i even you know, I know about ken ken livingston you know i lived in london for a while I, I remember the glc i mean ken livingston he's not just anybody who they threw under the bus they threw some yeah serious and perhaps that was a test case to see well if nobody comes to in his defense then we can just keep mm -hmm. going yeah, you and also I mean? he was he he was really the only uh, at that time because that was before Chris was um, back in the Labour Party, you know, back in Parliament. Um, he was really the only person who had uh, in the Labour Party only Corbyn's only defender in the Labour Party who had a national standing, who had like yeah. who had a national profile, you know, and uh, and who could get access to mainstream media you know, and who um, was somebody who um, could, uh, who was defending Corbyn and saying, yeah, look, this is rubbish. These are smears, you know? Um, so 
uh, it, 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 he was really targeted in that way, you know, by, by, you know, I want to, I want to segue, I want to, I want to segue to, uh, to the United States right now, uh, all morning, you know, there's been, um, we're talking about the democratic party and there's a progressive wing now, the democratic party, which grew by, by several members, uh, who are just elected newly members of Congress who are very progressive and part of this, uh, the squad, as they call AOC and some of the others, you know, they are all, uh, they're true fighters. I mean, God forbid, they won't describe themselves as socialists in America. Socialism is, a, you know, a bad word, but uh, they're, they are progressives and they also, uh, their stance, their progressive stance includes support of, 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 of a call for boycott, divestment and sanctions and, and support so solidarity with Palestinians because these are people who are activists before they they became uh, you know they got into into real life politics um, and I'm wondering if there are any lessons there for them right now because I mean they were elected um, the squad just got reelected which is good you know after two years it was there was, was there's was quite a it was it was in, it was questionable whether or not they would be able to overcome the opposition and get reelected and they got reelected and again they were strengthened now with at least two other uh, members of Congress, uh, Jamal Bauman and, and Cory Bush. Uh, is there a lesson here for the progressives in, in the Democratic Party? Uh, Asa, I wanted to go ahead and would you talk about that? The lesson is don't give an inch because yeah. like you can't. Like, and it's not, it's not about ideological purity or anything like that. It's simply you cannot win. You won't be able to win. You won't be able to win any kind of um, electoral victory for your party if um, you give in on this issue. If you give in, if you give in to the Israel lobby and you give in to Zionists in this way, um, you won't be able. If you if you give in, if you give in to the idea that, um, like, unfortunately, we did see uh, AOC do that, you know to an extent, like when she uh, criticized um, Ilhan Omar for make, when she made, Ilhan Omar made a accurate comment about the Israel lobby being fueled by yeah. uh, money, which it is, it's just a fact, you know. Um, and then saying, oh, well, you know, it was the way she phrased it was offensive and all this kind of thing. Um, but then of course she made up for it by refusing to go or, or canceling her, 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 her um... Uh, appearance at a, at a commemorate at an event commemorating uh, it's Rabin. so she kind of <laughs> she she's kind of know knows which side she's on a little bit more perhaps uh, perhaps right now. Um, but still, you, you know, you you think this would, would this would be easy because certainly the four of us and and many, if not all of the people, hundreds of people participating and people around the world explaining why Israel demonstrating why and how Israel is a racist endeavor is the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. It's the easiest thing in the world. Its own citizens who are Palestinians are denied rights, water, electricity, roads, and medical care. Its own citizens because they're Palestinians. Never mind 2 million people in the Gaza Strip and 5 million languishing in refugee camps that are not allowed to return because they're Palestinians had they been Jewish. So, I mean, it's very easy conversation to have and it's very easy to explain. Yet here we are, you know, um, barely holding on and of course like we saw in the, in the UK with, with with Jeremy Corbyn this was really a, a serious blow uh, and really just a final blow in in, in 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 a vicious campaign why do you suppose this is so difficult why do you suppose this is so complicated maybe Tony you want to say something about that it's it's obvious it's apparent it's clear the other side is clearly supporting racism and violence and and, and oppression well, of course, um, that's true. Of course, so that's why true. They, why are but they? They're... Go ahead. Well, I mean, you, you can take Tom Watson as a good example. He, Tom Watson vowed that he wouldn't rest until the last anti-Semite was expelled from the Labour Party. But this was a man who abstained on the 2014 Immigration Act, which led to the Windrush scandal, whereby hundreds, if not thousands, of black British citizens were illegally deported to the Caribbean. This was a man who stood up for the racist Labour MP Phil Woolers, who openly campaigned to, to make the white folks angry in his constituency in 2010 and was thrown out of Parliament by the High Court for egregious lying about his opponent. 
Tom Watson wrote he had lost sleep thinking about poor Phil. So the idea that these people were in any way concerned about racism, you know, is for the birds. Of course they weren't. No. Uh, and they were the ones who demonized asylum seekers under New Labour. So it's they clothed themselves in the bogus, the false anti-racism in order to give themselves moral legitimacy. I mean, that is what it's really about. And the problem with the anti-Semitism thing is it, it cuts into the fault line in the left, which is identity politics, because mm -hmm. Jews are part of a, are a separate identity, aren't they? Uh, the fact that Jewish identity has transformed itself in the last 70, 80 years, you know, Jews used to be synonymous with being on the left, not on the right. Trade union and the most militant trade unionists were Jewish trade unionists. That's how they broke down the barriers with the Dockers, for instance, who had been quite anti-Semitic in the East End. But identity politics says any identity, however reactionary it is, is equally valid with another identity. So you can posit Jews living in the suburbs of London who identify with Israel. They're equally valid with a Palestinian village which is suffering from a lack of water on the West Bank and whose crops are being burnt down by settlers. Uh, and therefore the IHRA makes the Palestinians anti-Semitic for protesting against the racism that they suffer from. I mean, that, that is the absurdity. Now, of mm -hmm. course, we have intersectionality, which takes this on board and that a, a single identity is not enough because it, it has a number of different strands to it. But that, I think, is one of the main problems. And that's why I'm a socialist. I, I, I believe class politics, Marxism, uh, enables you to understand society in a way that otherwise it's very difficult to. So you can see, for instance, when Corbyn came into power, the alarm bells rang. I mean, from Langley, Virginia, where the CIA is based, to MI5, to Tel Aviv and the military headquarters. The idea of a guy who's anti-NATO, anti-war, who's identified with the opponents of America, becoming possibly even prime minister of America's closest ally. I mean, they must have been, you know, terror stricken in some cases. That's where all of this originated. The problem with Corbyn is, I don't want to call him stupid, but he didn't get it. I mean, I, I, if I can quote, and I, I, I'm going to quote from the Labour leaked report. He actually believed that getting rid of me and Jackie Walker and Mark Wadsworth and Ken Livingston would improve his chances. And, and this is what it says on page 306 of the report. It says, Jeremy Corbyn himself and members of his staff team requested to GLU, that's a compliance unit, the, the governance and legal unit, that particular anti-Semitism cases be dealt with. In 2017, Lotto, that's the leader of the opposition staff, chased for action on high profile anti-Semitism cases Ken Livingston, Tony Greenstein, Jackie Walker and Mark Wadsworth, stressing that these cases were of great concern to Jewish stakeholders and that resolving them was essential to, and they quote, rebuilding trust between the Labour Party and the Jewish community. Well, we were expelled, but it didn't rebuild trust because they went on to demand a whole load more expulsions. And so it went on. The more people they expelled, the more people they demanded were expelled. Yeah. And of course, the more people you expelled, the greater proof there was that there was a real anti-Semitism problem. So Corbyn really was left with nothing to do. He was running on a, uh, what's it, a treadmill. The faster he ran, the faster the treadmill was. And so, so he went nowhere. He was just expelling people. And so, yes, Formby was far more effective at expelling people than McNichol. McNichol was extremely incompetent, the, the previous. So they were extremely efficient. But it didn't do them much good in the end. And it's interesting because none of this has anything to do with anti-Semitism. Like no, of course not. Of course not. And, and, the, and, 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 the, and the Ministry of Strategic Affairs in, in, in yeah. Jerusalem. These were really the powers that had to bring him down for all the reasons that you stated clearly. Of course, this man was an activist who talked about Palestinian rights. And so imagine him becoming, and, and Chris, you described, you know, the, the, the vision that Jeremy Corbyn and the promise that he had. And imagine this man be, sitting, going into, into Downing Street 10. That was a nightmare. And they were, I think they were going to do anything and everything they possibly could uh, to, to make that an impossibility. And it's interesting what you said also, Tony, about the, the idea of this Jewish identity because, and the idea of a Jewish community. Because one of the claims that's being made by 
that I see by the board of, of, of deputies of the Jewish, whatever they call the Jewish community of the UK mm -hmm. Jews and so forth, is that something like 98% of UK Jews are Zionists. Well, that's a lie because- It's, it's impossible because out of 260,000 uh, Jews in the UK, at least 60,000 live in Stamford Hill and are ultra-Orthodox Jews and are absolutely anti-Zionist. Anti not all well, of them. Well, some of them are, but Yachad, which is a liberal Zionist group, conducted a survey with City University in 2015, and they asked exactly that question of British Jews. Are you a Zionist? 59%, which was down 12% in five years, said yes. 31%, which is nearly a third, said no, and 10% didn't know whether they were a Zionist. So where they get a 98% figure well, from, I simply it. don't know. Well, they're Zionists, so they don't need to bite <laughs> them. Yeah. They, I think those are often interpretations when they say it's, it Zionism isn't that high, when they, they reinterpret um, certain responses to questions about, you know. Yes, they do. Or, they say if you identify with Israel, well, I, I identify with Israel, but not the way they expect. Yeah. So yeah. I, think, I, I think Tony's point about um, identity politics is is a is a good one because it's this is a, a real uh, this is a part of the one of the main reasons I would say why this has been such a successful campaign for um, the ministry of, the Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs against the left in this country and for the Labour right against Jeremy Corbyn is is this um, Israeli government led attempt to redefine um, Zionism, to redefine it into an identity, like just a personal identity of my my own, you know, how I, how I feel about myself and away from what it actually is, which is a concrete um, political ideology, which has um, very real negative effects on Palestinians, um, you know, in, from everything from um, expelling them, expelling um, 800,000 of them uh, in the Nakba in 1948, up until the present day, where um, their villages are being demolished because of what? Because of Zionism, you know? So um, the it's a rebranding exercise. It's been a rebranding exercise. When you, when you put it in those terms and say, I'm anti-Zionist because we don't want Palestinians to be expelled from their homes, um, to be discriminated against, um, and and to be killed. Um, that's why we're anti-Zionist. When you say it in those terms, then that's going to get a lot of support. But if you can ignore that and re and spin that and say, well, um, Zionism is just an expression of Jewishness. If then if someone says, uh, oh well, um, I'm an anti-Zionist then you are, if you believe that false definition, then it becomes um, anti-Semitism. So um, this is why this is, you know, this kind of exploitation of identity, the particular type of exploitation of identity politics that Tony described has been quite successful within the Labour Party left in, in dividing the left against itself. Yes, and, and I think I would point out as well that you cannot be claimed to be uh, to hold uh, progressive values uh, and at the same time be a Zionist because Zionism is an inherently racist, violent ideology that puts one people as superior to another. That's basically what Zionism is. And it doesn't matter how they try to color, color it to pink and yellow and God knows what other colors. Uh, it's, it is basically a racist ideology that says that Tony and I have more rights in Palestine than, than the Palestinians do. Um, and I want to segue back to the United States before, just before we, we, we um, open it up for questions. Um, they've been interviewing Jamal Bauman, who's one of the incoming members of Congress, and Ilhan Omar, and yesterday uh, AOC, about this new, the, what's going to happen within the Democratic Party. And thankfully, so far, their statements are very, very clear. And, and, uh, and like you said, Asa, they're, they're standing strong. I mean, Palestine was not the issue. Other issues came up, like... God forbid, people, everybody should have health care and things like that, or the environment. Uh, but they, they're, they're standing strong. They're saying, you know, we were elected it because of these values. These, this is what we're going to represent within the party. And now it all depends on, on, on we'll, see, we'll see what happens. Hopefully Palestine will be able to uh, push its way in there as well. And the fight, the fight against these accusations, you know, something that I think we need to take on as opposed to wait for them to come after us, which is seems like that's what's been, what's been happening 
uh, all around. And, and there's different, I think, like, I think, I think we need to, to, to take a close look at what happened in the Labour Party and, and the UK and, uh, and realize how close we were to something really fantastic and, and how it all came tumbling down. Um, Just to re-emphasize that the lesson, to answer your earlier question again, yeah. the lesson to learn is don't give an inch. You cannot give an inch. Like it Absolutely is. right, yes. Yeah. Yeah, you, and I think anybody who knows anything about bullies would, would, would say that. I mean, you don't, yeah. you don't give an inch to a bully because they're going to keep pushing you around. And um, and and I, I absolutely agree with everything that you that you've all said um, so far. So let's see, Jamil, shall we open it up um, to the questions? We've got a lot of questions, a lot of people chatting and asking questions. So let's. Uh, oh, yes, twenty seven. Sure thing. Yeah, and and we also received uh, uh, questions via email prior to to the event. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read one of those now. This one is from Gerald. Uh, and the question is, I was wondering how, with Seamus Milne as his communications director, Jeremy Corbyn direct, developed no strategy to deal with the anti-Semitism smears. After all, Seamus had written the book, The Enemy Within, which detailed the smear attacks on the NUM, and particularly Arthur Scargill during the miners' strikes, and would therefore be familiar with the types of attacks where the state and other actors come together in a cons concerted campaign to blacken the reputation of anyone representing a threat to the status quo. Chris, you want to take that on? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, Seamus never, never applied his own uh, advice, really, I guess. And uh, I think, you know, Seamus, Seamus, in my opinion, would have been better if he'd have stayed at The Guardian writing op-eds. Uh, I mean, he, he really, he didn't really step up to the role of the sort of strategic uh, P P PR advisor that he was appointed to do and the, the strategy that they employed as we've already said without repeating ourselves was utterly catastrophic and actually led directly to the situation that we're in today because the approach that they applied uh, only gave um, ammunition to and uh, and emboldened those who were making these bad faith actors who were making these lurid and uh, extreme accusations which had no basis in fact and the response was to lean into them and uh, and to take it on the chin and apologize and uh, and they just never learned a lesson i mean it was it was it was disastrous catastrophic and i don't know i mean what, what i mean somebody said <laughs> somebody suggested that uh, the um, the film the invasion of the body snatchers was in the Labour Party's case um, a question of science fact rather than science fiction because all these great figures that we previously looked to seem to be completely um, at odds with where we thought they were in terms of the positions that they took up and Seamus is, is a case in point sadly. Yes. I've no explanation for it it's just it's it's like uh, yeah it does make you a bit speechless. I think you're right. <laughs> you right, you seen gobsmacked there at me go in, in, in with my response. But I mean, what yeah. else can you say? I mean, he yeah. just he just he just he was not up to what he was appointed to do, in my opinion. Well, Corbyn never really understood the campaign against him. But the remarkable thing is, neither did his office. He had all these people around him, like oh. Seamus, and they never once devised a strategy. And it was, no. I think, quite simple. All Corbyn had to do was make a major speech yep. on the anti-Semitism issue saying, I oppose anti-Semitism, but I also oppose and condemn the weaponization of anti-Semitism against people who are supporters of Palestine. After all, anyone, I mean, everyone who's been involved and is involved in Palestine solidarity is accused of anti-Semitism. I doubt if there's a single person who has been campaigning around it, who has not been accused of anti-Semitism. We all know this. So why, why the pretense, this nonsense about if you deny your anti-Semitism, then you are anti-Semitic. This is the old Salem witch trials, wasn't it? Yep. If you denied you were a witch, that would prove you were a witch. Mm -hmm. It has the same logic to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think clearly attack is the best form, is the only form of, 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 Absolutely. of defense here. This is, uh, they need to be, reminded that they, supporting Zionism is supporting racism, clear and simple. There's no mm. anti-Semitism in, in, in Palestine solidarity, and it's impossible to be anti-racist if you are a Zionist. Of course. So these are the things oh. that I think... Uh, Although people individually can think they are, mm. and sometimes they are in some ways, but not other ways. 
because people have divided consciousness, a fragmented consciousness, as, as Marxists might say. Go ahead, Jamil. What's next? The next question is from Joe. The question is, some people are staying in the party to fight and keep a left-wing presence and hope Jeremy and Chris too will be back in. Others are hoping for a new party. What do the panel think is the way forward for the left? Whoever wants to jump in, go ahead. This is the good one. My, in my opinion, Mika, the, the Labour Party is dead as a vehicle for delivering socialism. It's dead as a vehicle to deliver a ethical foreign policy. It's dead as a vehicle to stand up for the Palestinian people. And in many ways, Jeremy Corbyn was a, as an aberration and the right wing of the Labour Party will not allow that scenario to arise again. And in my opinion, I think our best efforts should be devoted now to building an alternative. And what we need, in my opinion, is a two-pronged strategy. We need to build a social movement as well as an alternative electoral vehicle. I think if we put all our eggs in one or other basket, if we just focus exclusively on electoral strategy, this is where I think the Labour Party has gone wrong, to be honest, because there's no kind of real base to it in that sense. It's always been focused around, you know, winning elections rather than building a movement. And this was one of the things I was hopeful with Jeremy's leadership because he did talk about building a social movement. We were on the way to doing just that, but then we never really followed through. And I just think now what we should be focused on because look, where is the support for Jeremy? I mean, it's been very muted as I've already said from the people like the Socialist Campaign Group, uh, from the trade union movement. Um, it looked like Unite might take a stronger stand than they did, but they haven't in the end. In reality, you know, they've called their bluff. And I think what they should be doing, and I've been urging now, and we'll be launching a campaign in the not too distant future for a, a defund and disaffiliate uh, campaign for the trade union movement. This is what they should be doing. I mean, and, you know, I mean, just before I uh, we came on to the, the program today, I had a message from somebody on social media saying that, you know, that the we should be occupied I mean, in terms of standing up for Jeremy. Occu go and occupy the, uh, the Labour Party's head office, you know, make life difficult for them. The trade unions should be really following through on their uh, on their threat. This is unacceptable what you're doing to our uh, leader or our former leader. This is a man, as I've already said, who's devoted his life to the Labour movement, to fighting racism and socialism, the cause of socialism. Uh, unless you reinstate him, we are going to completely defund you. You go off to your rich benefactors if you wish, but we won't fund you anymore. This is the party that was born out of the trade union, but they're not doing it. So Starmer and company, Sir Keir Starmer, the pillar of the establishment and the right wingers and the, the Zionist lobby, they've called the bluff. And the left, once again, the left in parliament, that is, and the kind of upper echelons, not the grassroots, because many of the grassroots have been, have been very, very supportive. They've been left wanting and they've just been, you know, not up to the, not up to the uh, uh, required standard that's, that's needed to really you know, fight this battle out because what we know is that our opponents are incredibly ruthless. And unless we match that ruthlessness, we're just gonna get swallowed. We're just gonna get eaten alive as has happened. I mean, just look at what's happened. I would say to people watching this program now thinking of staying inside the Labour Party. And if you are gonna stay, for God's sake, don't be silent, speak out. Because if you don't, you're complicit in this whole disreputable affair that we've seen played out before us. And Chris, you've started a new movement anyway, haven't you? Well, we have, yes. I mean, and uh, I've got to be honest, we're slightly in the doldrums because of the impact of the COVID-19 uh, crisis, but we, we, we have a movement, yes, and uh, we've got thousands of members, but difficult to kind of organize activities on the yeah. ground. Uh, and this is part of what I believe we need in terms of trying to kind of create a social movement uh, and trying to do politics with people, not to people, bring people into our movement, sort of raise political consciousness, raise political expectations in that sense. And we've also been very clear in this movement will not just be one that's merely focused on the UK, as important as that is, because there's many problems confronting people in the UK, but we want to be very much as a high priority, a top priority, an equal priority with, with, with uh, you know, fighting for a better deal for uh, people in Britain, is to fight for, you know, an anti-imperialist strategy to, to express solidarity with liberation struggles around the world. And obviously right at the top of, of that list would be the struggle of the Palestinian people. We have to, in my opinion, be internationalist in our approach, be anti-imperialist as well as uh, having a kind of a socialist economic agenda at home. And raising political consciousness, raising political expectations, in my opinion, is a way to go. And from that, I'm hoping that we can kind of 
you know, as it were, build a desire for a new political vehicle. Because I honestly just think the Labour Party is so broken now uh, that it's really impossible to, to repair it. And if you think about it, the Labour Party has always been a tool of the establishment, really since its uh, foundation, or certainly since the end of the First World War, um, you know, in the aftermath of the Russian Revolution and so on, to, if you like, quell revolutionary fervour in the, in the working class. And I think we just need to recognize that, be real about it. And I think there was, you know, we, we used to be able to get some crumbs on the table. We saw what happened, you know, the 45 to 51 Labour government made some significant improvements, uh, built a sort of post-war consensus for, uh, you know, domestic policy. It was still very imperialist though in its foreign policy. Um, but now the left has been utterly crushed. I mean, there is just no, we've now got, as, we've, as you have in the United States of America, two establishment parties. And it doesn't really matter which party gets in, uh, the kind of neoliberal war machine will continue. You know, the, the military industrial complex will still be, you know, center stage. And uh, that's if we're serious about railing against that, I think we, we have to build uh, and grow a new movement and potentially a new electoral vehicle. Because I, can, I just can't see how the Labour Party, just can't see what the mechanisms are to actually make that Labour Party a vehicle, again, to, that might embrace a sort of agenda that Jeremy Corbyn was uh, promoting when he became the leader. That's anathema to uh, Sir Keir Starmer and the parliamentary Labour Party. We've no means of replacing these uh, people inside the uh, parliamentary Labour Party now. We haven't got any, there's no open selection process and no process of calling them to and account. It was a big struggle, wasn't it? The open selection was a big struggle. It was a big struggle and, and, and we lost it. And again, that you know, the, uh, the, uh, left so-called left leaders of, of the movement let us down i mean let, let, let mccluskey who was the unite general secretary's policy of unite is to support democracy in terms of open selections they passed that motion at their own conference in i think 2016 in the aftermath of the coup against jeremy corbyn at that 2018 conference when these democracy reforms are being debated Len McCluskey led his delegation to oppose it. And the votes, as you may know, Miko, are split between the grassroots activists have 50% of the votes and the trade union delegates, delegations have 50% of the votes. 90 plus percent of the grassroots activists supported these democratic reforms, supported uh, open selections. Right. All the trade union delegations, apart from the fire brigade union, opposed them. Had Unite supported them because they are a big affiliate um, trade union, Th th those reforms would have sailed through and the course of history would have been totally different. Yeah, I, I think Jeremy Corbyn would have been 10, would be in 10 Downing Street now. I would still be a Labour MP and we'd be in the process of implementing socialism at home and an ethical foreign policy abroad and, and having a government that is absolutely committed to the cause of the Palestinian people would be in office now. And all of that has been squandered. All of that has been lost because of the, of a, of a, of a, I don't know what it was. I mean, a failure of nerve. I don't know why, but I mean, because there was overwhelming support for it from the grassroots for those democratic reforms. I mean, you know, that was the beginning of the end of the Corbyn project. Yes. The anti Semitism smears ramped up after that, you know, and um, the rest is history. And uh, that's why I think we need to start again. I mean, others may take a different view, but I just can't see there's any future for the Labour Party. I regret to say that. I mean, I gave 44 years of my life, Miko, to the Labour Party. It can't be, it can't be easy. It can't be an easy thing to say for you, Chris. Uh, Jamil, you want to go on next one? Sure. This one is from Kathy. The question is, none of this would have worked without a hostile press. What to do about the press? Well, that's another reason, just quickly, why I think um, Jeremy was targeted, because he was very committed to implementing the uh, the Leveson inquiry recommendations, Leveson 1 is so-called, uh, and also Leveson 2 to embark upon that. And he also gave a, a really important speech at the Edinburgh Festival, I think it was in 2018, where he talks about democratizing the media, uh, breaking up the big, uh, you know, uh, media uh, uh, conglomerates, which are, you know, owned by sort of tax side billionaires who exert a huge amount of power and he, and he wanted to sort of democratize that democratize the, the bbc he talked about creating local um, journalistic sort of collective cooperatives to do investigative journalism at a local level and so on it's, it, it was a really important speech and that was yet another reason why you know he was yeah. deemed as persona non grata 
And you know, we did we did a panel uh, a few weeks ago with John Pilger and uh, Ray McGovern and Roger Waters about uh, about Julian Assange and why the press is not standing. Yes, up. exactly. The, the journalists would stand up. Would be the first That's one. That's right. I yeah. mean, it, what it proves, what this has shown over the last five years, is that the Guardian is as much as part of the corporate media as the Daily Mail and the yeah. Daily Express and the Times and so on. It, it's been abysmal. And of Guardian course, over words, Julian yeah. Assange, I mean, uh, was it five filters have reproduced 44 hostile articles uh, dating, but, and that's 18 months ago. I mean, absolutely abysmal and atrocious and despicable. You know, here's a guy who was in prison for revealing war crimes. You know, yeah. I mean, what, what greater injustice can there be? And yet the British press, with two or three notable exceptions, people like Peter Oborn, a Tory journalist, yeah. uh, Hitchens, Peter Hitchens, another Tory journalist, and uh, who is it, Patrick Coburn of the Independent. They're the only three journalists who've actually mm -hmm. stood out. It's been absolutely atrocious. Uh, and then they talk about freedom of the press. So I think we need to establish a labour movement press. I mean, we have the Morning Star, but we need a, really something that's bigger circulation. Uh, than it, and it's maybe wider politically, but that's well, well, what I'm, I'm, I'm working with some people. I mean, as you know, Tony, just in terms of our uh, grassroots movement, and uh, the, the, there is uh, now an effort to to launch a new uh, uh, Sunday newspaper, which I think is is called The Word. Uh, that will be, uh, I think, in January. That's the plan uh, to try and supplement, you know, mm. the Morning Star, which is the only daily newspaper we've got. It never gets any newspaper reviews on the BBC that's paper right. review. Uh, the sky you know it's, i mean it's a daily paper why i mean this is just clear uh, mm. uh discrimination it, it, it's clear political bias that they're not mm. actually giving them a i mean i think that would help in terms of their circulation but i think what we need to do miko is is more of these types of things that you're hosting uh, this evening um and um you know we've got our own resistance uh, youtube broadcast uh, channel we've got outlets like obviously the fantastic electronic intifada that uh, that Asa uh, writes for and uh, the Canary. So, so there are these alternative platforms that are springing up and I think we need to promote them uh, as much as we can. Uh, and, and I think particularly with the younger generation uh, people are increasingly turning away from the corporate media and looking for alternative mm -hmm. um, sources of, of information. And, well, they've and made it's really a duty well, to they? do that. And that's where I think what the trade unions ought to be doing. I mean, you know, there was an attempt, I think in the 1980s to, to, uh, to create an alternative paper. And I think the that's trade right. unions were involved in that. But, the, the, what's it called? The News on Sunday, I believe. Yes. But yes. That's the Why are the trade unions? The trade unions should be doing this because they are being, as we know, absolutely demonised and, and pilloried in, 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 the, in the disgusting corporate uh, gutter media. Uh, and uh, Tony's right. We, we need to, to find a way of, of uh, uh, you know, building an alternative to that. And that's beginning to start. But I mean, you know, the trade unions could make a really big contribution to that. And in fact, actually, it would be a better use of their resources than continuing to fund a political party, the Labour Party, that essentially doesn't speak for the organised working class in this country. It speaks for corporate capitalism. That's what it does. It's, it, you know, it is a defender of the neoliberal status quo. And yes, if support, we're serious about challenging that, then, then, you know, the trade unions need to step up. I think most of the, uh, many of their active members, anyway, their grassroots members, would, would probably agree with that. It's just that, unfortunately, the leadership uh, you know, in these institutions often doesn't necessarily reflect the, you know, the views of their active uh, membership base. Hey, so what are you it's, saying? Is that, well, so you're support saying? independent journalism. Support the, Don't subscribe to The Guardian. Don't fund The Guardian. Don't fund Owen Jones. No, um, absolutely. No. Uh, give, give money to the Electronic Intifada. Um, you know, subscribe to The Morning Star. The Canary, you know, these these um, support media that supports us, you know, instead of, um, yeah, you know, giving out giving money away to the Guardian, mm -hmm. which is just doing its best to sabotage us. And when that works well, hey, sir, I think whether you would agree, I mean, in the 2017 election campaign, as we know, the corporate media was lined up against us and everybody was kind of, you know, they were all predicting disaster and Corbyn was, a, you know, this terrible individual who was, was going to lead Labour to catastrophe. And, you know, thanks to that kind of alternative media, those alternative media platforms, thanks to the kind of, you know, social media uh, platforms. And, and when, when this was when momentum was working properly, as it were, and focused instead of, you know, becoming the useful idiot for the Zionist the lobby as it did, uh, we were able to mobilise, you know, millions of people. So it can be done. 
Uh, it just needs, you know, yeah, the, the, the CST, the Community Security Trust, uh, a very uh, a, a Zionist lobby group, essentially, um, a you know, an Israel lobby group, um, which uh, it, it put out a report, you know, attacking me, but it did, uh, and uh, and others and activists within left wing activists within the Labour Party, um, for ridiculous things like they said that, um, uh, using the hashtag sack Tom Watson was a, <laughs> was evidence of anti-Semitism. Totally That's ridiculous. Right. You know, the, the form then the, who was Tom Watson, who was then the uh, uh, deputy leader of the Labour Party who spent all his time attacking Jeremy Corbyn um, and saying Corbyn was, you know, implying Corbyn was anti-Semitic and so, so on and so forth. Um, well, it's absurd. It gets to an absurd level. I mean, I was accused, I was on the Andrew Neil um, radio program the other day uh, about the aftermath of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission report and just before I was interviewed Margaret Hodge was on there and I before I answered the first question that he put to me said that uh, let me just deal with some of the comments that your previous uh, guest um, uh, spoke about there uh, because it sounds to me I don't know where you was interviewing or where, where she was where, where you were interviewing but it sounds to me that she was uh, residing on planet Zog. That I was accused of uh, that apparently referring to somebody as residing on planet Zog is, is apparently an, an anti-Semitic um, reference. Zionist occupied government, that's why. It's the same acronym, but it's obviously a different yes. phenomenon. Yes, exactly. Go on to the next it's question. The absurdity it gets to though, you know. It is, yeah. Um, but just to, fin just to finish my point about um, the CST, um, they stated that um, in that report they from last year they stated that um you know in the attack on me they stated that i had achieved narrative dominance that the electronic intifada had achieved narrative dominance online so they um you know they they are clearly afraid of alternative media and for of, the, of course yeah, they are the, yes what does that mean uh, 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 what does that even mean uh, they, were saying, they were saying they were saying that on on the issue of Labour Party, the is Israel slash Palestine, as they put it, um, and of Labour anti-Semitism, the electronic intifada had achieved narrative dominance online. So that they 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 were basically saying that um, they were basically complaining that if you went online and you went on um social media and you people were passing around electronic intifada articles not guardian articles uh, and that you know they were reading um you know they were they were getting a, an alternative take where where we were saying oh, look this is a smear campaign essentially and they weren't getting so like the the, the image that's out there i think we yes mainstream media has a lot of power but we underestimate our own power sometimes yeah yeah, no, I think that's a good, then that's a good thing. Then if if they're trying yeah. to get any kind of narrative dominance on, on these issues, that's a good thing. Go ahead, Jimmy. Let's see if we can squeeze in one last uh, one last question before we let everybody go. Sure. This one is from John. The question is: Do you think Jeremy has a legitimate case to stu to sue Starmer and the party for a suspension or a possible expulsion? Oh boy, well, there's a loaded question. Let's go around. We'll go Tony, Asa, and then Chris. You you give us the final world. Go ahead, Tony. What do you think? Well, I, I'm not sure what he would sue him for, apart from defamation. I've just lost a case against the campaign against anti-Semitism, which is quite interesting because uh, there are two defences in libel. Either what you said is true or what you said was an honest opinion. Uh, and when it came to it, they didn't want to have to defend what was they said was true. So they said, well, it's our honest opinion. It doesn't matter if it's true. And that's the reality of all these accusations. There's no substance uh, behind them. I think the thing about Starmer is he came in to the leadership determined to drive the left out of the leadership. Three mm. months ago, Canary and others reported that, and it was a leak from Starmer's office, that Corbyn would be suspended when the HRC report was issued. I have no doubt at all that if Corbyn had said nothing, he would still have been suspended. The fact that he made a statement was just a pretext. Uh, I mean, that's what he wants, to eradicate all traces of what they, they call Corbynism. Uh, and people have to see Starmer is the main enemy. He's, he's been f useless ag against Boris Johnson's handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, he said nothing about the privatisation of track and trace systems. 
anything to do with the social questions, which are the bread and butter issues for working class people, he has nothing to say. He He's a bipartisan approach. You know, he, he supports Johnson uh, in the in the national interest, whatever that is. Uh, so, I mean, Starmer is the person we have to target. He is a Zionist. He said it to the Times of Israel. I'm an unqualified... I'm a Zionist without qualification, so we I should support take Zionism without qualification. That's right. That's yes, I mean, it, it, there's no doubt where he stands, and unfortunately, the campaign group have these illusions. You can somehow unite with him. It's an absurdity. It's like exactly. uniting with a wild animal that's about to tear you to pieces. You can't do it. <laughs> exactly. You know, there's a question here. I got to throw it in there just because I think it's a really good question uh, in the Q and A uh, window here. I'll combine it because it's two, it's two questions that I think are really good and, 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 and they apply, I think, across the board, certainly in the UK, but in the US and beyond. Um, do you think that topics like Islamophobia will ever be treated like anti-Semitism in the UK? Uh, or is it a privilege that only Zionist lobby get to acquire? And do you think that British politics in general, and I think this applies to US and and, and, and as well, uh, do you think there'll be a, a day where politicians and the media will actually differentiate between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism? And basically, I would add to that, realize that anti-Zionism is anti-racism. Do you see that happening in, in, any, in, any, in any way, shape or form, either in the UK or here in, or, or, or in the US? What do you think, Asa? Um Yes, but not for a long time. I think. Well, I don't know. I don't want to be too. What would it would take for that to happen? It would take a big cultural shift, cultural and political shift. Really, I mean, things have been really set back by this. Yeah. So um, the pendulum by, all the way at the end that now it might shift back so that we can see these things. You think? It, things can change really quickly. Yeah. You know? Things can change really quickly. Um, right now, it looks pretty much impossible, um, but you know things can. We're in unprecedented times in a lot of ways, so um, it's. Uh, I think things could change very quickly. You know, there, there's, there is a like. It's, this is why it's so frustrating because there's, there's a mass base um, of Labour Party members sort of waiting to be led. So. Uh, it goes goes towards Chris's point earlier about um, you know people uh, there there there's a big desire for change and not just among the um, activists but among um, you know ordinary people yeah. there's a big desire for change and um, as, as uh, for people's lives to improve but you know it, as well is opening up the the question of palestine and people are getting kind of a crash course in i've, I've got over the last years a, a crash course in political education of um what's the, the 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 dirtiness of the israel lobby i suppose in a lot of ways yeah. chris you've seen a lot of changes over the years things going in different directions do you think there's a you know, embracing the idea, number one, that Islamophobia is a problem and should be treated like anti-Semitism, and also that anti-Zionism is a form of, is a struggle against racism. Do you think this is something that in the UK... I mean, as a socialist, I mean, I'm an eternal optimist. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think to be a member of the Labour Party for as long as I was, you, you kind of um, you have to be a, an optimist. So, I, I mean, I think, uh, as they were saying, things can change quickly. And in my opinion, the... The Zionist lobbies overplayed their hand. Um, you know, every, as we've already said, every every concession that they've been given, they've wanted more. I mean, and now they're going for Jeremy Corbyn. And I just think, I mean, I was saying this anyway, I mean, several years ago, that many people have kind of sort of tuning out of the accusations. It's only the kind of chattering classes and the sort of, you know, people um, sort of close to the Labour Party, I think, who really kind of took this that, that seriously although having said that of course it, it was so intense i think there was a perception whether people were that bothered about it of course remained i mean i'm not absolutely certain they were but i think there was a perception that labor was um considerably more anti-semitic as a party than than the reality i mean the reality was i mean i had 44 years i never met anybody who was anti-semitic in the party and i think even the the figures that jenny formby produced demonstrated it was something in the order of 0.03 
percent of, of, of people. And even then, I think it was more ignorance rather than necessarily malice. So the point that Ken Livingstone... Oh, what do you say? You ask people, are you anti Semitic? I mean, how would you even know? Well, indeed. I mean, Ken Livingstone makes a point, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a raging anti Semite or racist or bigot, you know, why would you join the Labour Party? I mean, exactly. It just makes no, no sense at all. So, you know, so I think they've overplayed their hand. And I think what we need to do is hold our nerve, be strong, uh, be clear, speak the truth. Speak the truth as you were outlining, uh, Miko, in relation to uh, the situation in, in Palestine and the abuse that the uh, Israeli regime is, is meeting out. Be clear about that. Be clear about what's happening. Stick, stick to your guns. Never apologize. I've made that mistake. Do not apologize for telling the truth. And I mean, in terms of uh, Jeremy's legal case, the, the, the original uh, question that you were asking us to, to, to answer, it, it, maybe not a a legal case directly against Keir Starmer, but I think he could have a strong case against the party. I took the party on in the High Court when they suspended me and won. I took the EHRC on when they sought to name me and won. And I, in the aftermath of the High Court case against me, where I was awarded all of my costs against the Labour Party, 100% of them, uh, which we'd raised anyway through a crowdfunding exercise, was then used to create a left legal fighting fund. And we've been busily helping many activists uh, who have been smeared and framed, uh, you know, by the Zionist lobby. And, uh, you know, we'll continue to do that. I mean, they're engaged in a process of lawfare and we're gonna meet them with lawfare tactics as well. They apply a maximalist strategy. We in turn are applying a maximalist strategy in response. And I'm confident we'll win. We are not gonna back down. Uh, the, the, the days of retreating, the days of capitulation are over. We have to stand strong and our solidarity is what will carry us through. Just remember the words of the, uh, of the Percy Shelley poem, I would say to people, where he talked about the final verse of the Mask of Anarchy, to rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number, shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep have fallen on you, because ye are many and they are for you. I mean, there's millions of people who, who support the program that, yes. you know, we wanted to uh, uh, bring about. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people, of, of, of activists who were inspired by that program that yeah. Jeremy Corbyn uh, put forward at that uh, time. So there are more of us than them. I mean, they might have lots of resources, you know, they may have powerful friends in, in the media and so on, as we know they have. And, you know, they can exert that and do exert that, 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 uh, that influence and they have done over the years, I mean, against all Labour administrations. But I mean, if we stick together, we will defeat them. And I'm confident we are going to defeat them. So I'm optimistic. If we stand together and recognise the power of our collective solidarity, we are undefeatable. Yeah, I think I think that's a that, that's a great message, Chris. And your, your optimism is something that I've been inspired by since since I've known you. And I just want to add to that that your quote and you talk about ending the capitulation reminds me of a quote by Hassan Kanafani, the Palestinian writer who was assassinated by the Israelis in Beirut in 1972. He was asked about negotiating with Israel and he said, you don't really negotiating, you mean capitulation. Because negotiating with Zionists, negotiating with racists, negotiating with people who are coming to kill you is, is, is really capitulation. Um, so in that, in that spirit of optimism and, 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 uh, and standing up and standing firm, I think we should end this, uh, this wonderful uh, conversation. I want to thank you so much, Tony and Asa and Chris. It's always a pleasure to speak to you and see you. And, thank you, Asa, um, and everyone that's participating. We've had a solid, a solid close to 300 people participating. in, in Over the, 300. Over 300. So, yeah. And so thank you all again. And, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll see you soon, I hope. Take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.